Last week we looked at uh, images and showed some of the processions that were taking place around Rome in the 6th and 7th century um, around uh, early encaustic icons that were incredibly powerful images. And these images survived the iconoclastic controversy that happened in the, in the Byzantine Empire. And these images were, um, were treated as persons. They were not uh, modes of communication. They were not means of communications. They were actually conveyors of a kind of presence. And so you have these, uh, these liturgies in which the images have their feet washed, if you can find their feet or maybe the base of the icon have their feet washed several times. Um, they'll be paraded out to meet other icons in uh, solemn ceremonies. And all of this is incredibly powerful, incredibly moving. And to the Western uh, eye and to the eye of people uh, in the, in the uh, 21st century, just a little bizarre. It's hard for us to sometimes see that kind of veneration. And so, what we're doing this week is we're stepping back um, and then stepping forward. We're going back to um, look at how iconography developed as a tradition in um, middle and late Byzantium. And what happens is this is where we're going to start to move into the icons that you and I would recognize when we go into an Eastern Orthodox church. You're going to come into uh, ultimately a canon of images that people use to depict the different aspects of the life of Christ and his victory over uh, the powers of sin, death, and evil. And icons become something that you read and something that you write. And so I begin with this. Uh, this is uh, the icon that was the teaser for today. Uh, I picked it up because you see this, this kind of entwining of, of three things that you'll see as icons develop. You'll see the cross, you'll see the gospel book, and then you'll see the icon working together. So this is from St. Nicholas of Myra, Nicholas the Wonder Worker. Um, he's holding a book, which is the, the, the gospels. You see crosses all over him. You see scenes from his life, uh, which are, are very much like the life of Christ. Um, uh, some people would call that legenda, you know, uh, there's a, there are moments in the lives, of the lives of the saints in which they seem to recreate in their own lives the larger story of the gospel. So there's a famous uh, legend of St. Francis where he's preaching and someone falls asleep and falls out of the window and St. Francis goes and revives the person. The same thing happened in the book of Acts with St. Paul. And this is a confirmation of, 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 of Francis's um, power and holiness. Does that mean he was a good preacher? Well, he fell asleep, right? So, he's certainly a long preacher. Um, <laughs> you be the judge, Barry. So, I want to step back though and talk about how um, images were rehabilitated in the 8th and 9th century um, season. So, the first part I would like to look at is the, the kind of, uh, to revive, to kind of revisit this idea of, of iconoclasm and, and, and in a sense one of the ways to think about this time period is that the, the iconoclasm was a um, was the, the time in which the symbol was prized over the image the symbol of the cross or the symbol of the bread and the wine so Byzantine Emperor Constantine um, these I think are the dates of his reign the imitation of Christ he believed uh, and images uh, threaten to divide his humanity from his divinity. So in other words, when you see an icon representing Christ, you're seeing a picture of Christ's humanity, but you're not capturing the divinity of Christ. And so he saw this as a threat against the belief Christians have in the incarnation. And so his argument was that really the only proper places to find um, the, the, the Christ is not... Uh, through the hand of a painter, but through the uh, life of a saint, and in the and in, and in the Eucharist, um, and so the cross and the Eucharist are the only physical signs uh, of the spirit and truth of the faith. And if you look at our excerpt for today uh, that I have is from the Iconoclastic Council of 754. This is uh, this is basically what was written. It may have been right from Constantine's hand. The only admissible figure of the humanity of Christ, however, is bread and wine. This is on page three. 
is bread and wine at the Holy Supper. This in no other form, this in no other type, has he chosen to represent his incarnation. Ready order to be brought, not, but not a representation of the human form, so that idolatry might not arise. And as the body of Christ is made divine, so also this figure of the body of Christ, the bread, is made divine by the descent of the Holy Spirit. It becomes the divine body of Christ by the mediation of the priest who, separating the oblation from that which is common, sanctifies it. The evil custom of assigning names to the images does not come down from Christ and the apostles and the Holy Fathers, nor have these uh, left behind then any prayer by which an image should be hallowed or made anything else than ordinary matter. Supported by the Holy Scriptures and the Fathers, we declare unanimously in the name of the Holy Trinity that there shall be rejected and removed and cursed one of the Christian Church, every likeness which is made out of any material and color, whatever by the evil art of painters. So in the place, this is a, an apse, and it, it initially this had a figure, you could almost see the outline of it, of, of, of the Virgin Mary holding the child Jesus, the infant Jesus. It was painted over, and you can see uh, a cross has been placed in its, um, in, in, in its place. And that's from uh, Hagi Irene, uh, Irene uh, in, Ist in Istanbul, um, Turkey. So as we continue, what you see is actually a shift that happens from uh, uh, symbol over image to image over symbol. And uh, uh, the position that, that, that Constantine articulated was refuted by uh, two church leaders. One was Nicephorus, who was the patriarch of Constantinople, and Theodore of Studium, who was a Byzantine monk and abbot. And they drew from an earlier line of reflection that stated if Christ had, can be described by the word graptos, he can also be described by an image, paragraptos, since both were forms of the Greek word graphe, which means both writing and painting. So let me say that again. So what he's arguing is that that any time you have, if Christ is revealed by a word, Christ can also be revealed by an image because the, the faculty that's being utilized by the Holy Spirit is the faculty of writing, whether it's in written word or it's the kind of writing that is a painting because in that context, um, to paint something is to literally write it. And so from this, we see three things that begin to generate. Um, the first is the use of images goes with the flow of the incarnation, is what they argued. So drawn from Neoplatonism, they argued that every image refers back to its archetype and contains within it the latter's uh, essence or dynamis or power, energy. Christ is the image of God, and therefore images have a role to play in revealing God to us. To suggest otherwise was to deny the reality of the incarnation and divide Christ into the person and nature. So in other words, to say that this image of Christ is only capturing his human image is actually to deny what happened when Christ was incarnate. What in fact this is doing is this creating an image of both the human and divine Christ. And that image participates in the essence or usia or form of the, of the, of the, of the, of the reality. And because of that, it becomes our way of reaching into it. So they drew from Basil the Great, who in a uh, major uh, work that was done in the fourth century, had actually used the connection between the emperor and the emperor's coin, the image of the emperor on a coin, to argue that, the, um, that there, was, there, was an in, there was an indivisible relationship between Christ, the Son of God, the Logos, and God the Father, which is a remarkable thing. So, in other words, Basil says that when you receive a coin with the emperor's head on it, you are actually um, experiencing and receiving some of the glory of the emperor. And just because the emperor has been repeated on the image of the coin, it, it doesn't mean that there are two emperors. In the same way, when Christ is the image of God and is presented to us as God and man, we're not receiving, uh, uh, we're not dividing the the, the, the God in into two gods. So Basil makes this deep connection between a physical image and its divine referent and its, and its godly referent. And on the basis of that, these two writers 
argued that images had their own legitimacy. So it was a kind of subtle move that Basil did. I'm going to skip the Basil passage because it's a little bit, uh, the translation I'm not pleased with. Um, uh, but, but you'll see just at the last line, it says, uh, How then, if one and one, are there not two gods? Because we speak of a king and not of the, and of the king's image and not of two kings. The majesty is not, even, is not cloven in two, nor the glory divided. Uh, another uh, major step forward was done by John of Damascus, in which he argued that um, that, that, that all of the uh, God is present in all of his uh, images of, of Christ. And uh, I'm going to go right to the middle of this, this passage. When sensible things sufficiently render what is beyond sense and give a form to what is intangible, a medium would be reckoned imperfect according to our standard if it did not fully represent material vision or the required effort of mind. If therefore Holy Scripture, providing for our need, ever putting before us what is intangible, clothes it in flesh, does it not make an image of what is thus invested in our nature and brought to the level of our desires, yet indivisible? A certain conception through the senses thus takes place in the brain, which is not there, uh, there before, it is transmitted to the judicial faculty and added to the mental store. So what is John saying? John's saying, even when you read the scriptures, you're getting these mental images in your mind of who Jesus is. In the same way, an image that has been painted is just doing the same thing. It's giving you an idea of who Jesus is. All that needed to happen at this point was to somehow put into, um, to carefully delineate the proper veneration of the, uh, of the image. And, and the way they did that is they basically followed the form, the way that people uh, treated the Word. So just as you would venerate the Word of God, but you wouldn't adore the Word of God, you would adore the, the, the God who is revealed in the Word. So with an image, you would venerate the image and not, not adore the image, but worship the image, uh, the, the, the source of the image, which is God. So. Um, this uh, led to the affirmation of images in the Second Council of Nicaea. And, um, and here is a really important uh, 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 thing. It, 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 it was, uh, let me just see if I remember to put this in. I may have forgotten to place this in the... Um, no, I did it. So here's the fourth council of the second council of Nicaea, um, and here I'm just going to go um, at the first part. We therefore, following the royal pathway and the divinely inspired authority of our holy fathers, such as uh, Basil and the traditions of the Catholic Church, define with all certitude and accuracy that just as the figure of the precious and life-giving cross so also the venerable and holy images, as well as in painting and mosaic, as of other fit materials, should be set forth in the holy churches of God, and on the sacred vessels, and on the vestments, and on hangings, and, and pictures, both in houses, and by the wayside, to wit the figure of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, all of our spotless lady, the mother of God, and the honorable angels, and all saints, and all pious people. The... Um, for by, do, for by so much more frequently as they are seen in artistic representation, by so much more readily are men lifted up to the memory of their prototypes, and by a longing after them, and to these should be given due salutation and honorable reverence, not indeed that true worship of faith which pertains alone to the divine nature, but to these as to the figure of the precious and life-giving cross and the book of the Gospels, and to all other holy objects, incense and lights may be offered according to the ancient pious custom. So again, look at that kind of movement that's being done. It's saying that you should, you should give reverence um, to these things. 
um, just as you would revere the book of the Gospels or, or anything else that is, uh, high, that is pious and holy, but you should not um, uh, truly adore them, because that's the key. And that, um, that um, led to the, um, the, the, the kind of placing on par, to go to, to part two, of images with the veneration given to the scriptures in the gospel book. So the, the fourth council of Constantinople um, argued that this made, uh, uh, meant that painters of images like the gospel writers themselves had to see their work as inspired by the Holy Spirit. In other words, when someone was going to paint an image, they actually stood in the place of the gospel writer himself or herself. And that was this major move that takes place. So all of these practices continue today when you read about icons uh, being written by people who pray. What they're actually doing when they're writing an icon is they are engaging in act in a, in a, they're participating in God's own revelation of God's self, just as if they were writing uh, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, this depended on a distinction that many people in the Western church didn't get. Um, they, they, they meant that reverence, the, the term reverence that is used is, is Greek for, it's called proskinesis, which is, um, uh, is uh, derived from kissing. You, you kiss and reverence something. You, 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 you show it um, uh, love, as it were. Um, but you don't engage in adoration or worship or latria because that was only due to God. So you would, you would reverence the peace, but, but the, 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 the worship was something that was deeper and, and more transcendent. Now this was lost on uh, the West at the time um, because they translated those two Greek terms as both um, adoratio in Latin, adoration. And so the Frankish church in particular just freaked out when they got this this Council of Nicaea was sent to them. They said, you know, we have nothing against images. We just think this whole idea of referencing them is a little weird. Um, we don't quite get it. We think it's, it's, you know, the adoration should go to God. So third, uh, so, so one, of the, one of the ways in which you can see this, this new sensibility is the emperor's door. Now this was done by Leo the, the, the sixth, the wise. Um, this is a depiction of him begging for forgiveness for marrying his mistress and fourth wife Zoe in order to legitimize his heir Constantine the seventh. Um, and flanking Christ is you have the Virgin Mary and the uh, angel Gabriel. And on it you have this, um, this book that's been opened and in it it says, peace be with you, I am the light of the world. And so what's happening here is you see, uh, in some ways, not just Constantine worshiping Christ, but you see a kind of pattern of adoration of the image, right? So he's teaching, there's a kind of teaching device happening in the, in the, in the piece itself, in which you're seeing this, uh, the adoration that, that he's showing, kissing the feet, of, the, of, of Christ is a kind of um, uh, teaching tool for how you should engage in the reverence due an image. Um, it's a magnificent piece. It's not a great slide, but it's also way high up. And this was the door that only the emperor would go through. So the placement of this is meant to create a kind of uh, ritual space where the emperor would be reminded that, that he could not um, he did not have ultimate power in the world. And the, the reminder is one of the emperors who, um, yes, it was his fourth wife. Um, not, not uh, uh, we can all say that this was maybe not the, the best of behavior, um, no matter what. But he, you know, part of this was a question of, of finding a, a, an heir that could succeed the throne. And so, um, the, uh, this reenacts, the church finally allowed Leo to get married his fourth wife, but they said only with a, a long penance. So here you have this incredible moment in which you have the church's authority and God's authority being set over earthly authority. And here you have Christ depicted on a throne uh, in glory as the true emperor. 
Any questions before I jump onto the really fun stuff? <laughs> so third, a third thing that is that is being uh, depicted here is there's a movement from from treating the lamb, from treating uh, how how Jesus is depicted on the cross. So Justinian II um, uh, decreed that the proper symbol for Christ on the cross is the lamb, and this is a close up of a beautiful cross that he uh, gave to uh, the people of Rome uh, in the 6th century, and it's in the Museum of the Treasure of St. Peter's Basilica, and it gives you an example of that. But because images were seen as truly mediating the incarnation of Christ, it became important for people not just to depict Christ, but also to depict Christ in death with his eyes closed. And so, in the 8th century, this magnificent um, uh, image begins to arise of a Christ hanging on the cross with his eyes closed. This is from the, um, the Holy Monastery in Sinai, Egypt, St. Catherine's. And here you have a complex movement where you have, um, you know, St. Mary, St. John is beginning to take on some of the biblical narrative is starting to be worked into it. And you have... Um, uh, blood and, and, and water flowing down the side of Christ, which is also a type of the, uh, of the Eucharist. So you see how the image is starting to actually structure the rituals. A uh, magnificent piece, don't you think? So, um, and then finally, you'll see that uh, the images begin to reenact the space in which worship occurs. So what happens here, and this is from uh, 1050, this is St. Sophia of uh, Macedonia, 1050. The, uh, uh, this had been uh, plastered over, and this had been a uh, mosque, um, starting at least uh, you know, in the uh, 11th century or so. And this is the uh, minbar, which is the, this is the, the, the pulpit that uh, mosques use that was constructed in the fourth cent 14th century. But what's key here is you have a traditional apse, and here you have Christ with the traditional altar that was used in Eastern Orthodoxy at that time period. And this is not a, a recreation of the Last Supper. This is a recreation of the Eucharist Christ has in heaven. There's no, there's no attempt to communicate to people that this was a uh, historical reenactment of the Last Supper. You see Christ holding a classic, uh, the, the loaf that was used at that time, and he's gesturing towards the apostles who are receiving it uh, with their hands cloaked, which is a classic uh, symbol of, of martyrdom. Um, I'm sorry, with their hands what? Cloaked. So they don't, you don't see their hands. Their hands are cloaked, and often they're covered, which, um, which uh, believe it or not, uh, in certain uh, variants of Anglicanism, when you do benediction with a blessed sacrament, you have these enormous sleeves without thumbs or fingers that you put on, and then you grab the, the monstrance, which is the thing you hold on to that holds the, the, uh, the, the Eucharistic wafer that's been placed in it, and you make the sign of the cross like this for the people of God, and they, they bless themselves. So we still do this today in certain corners of the Episcopal Church. I did it once, and I think I was the tallest guy ever to do it, because I hit the light of the presence when I went up. <laughs> and everybody went, uh-oh. <laughs> so but, so that, that's a classic sign. And so in Ravenna, for example, in San Vitale, um, they, the, the apostles will have their hands cloaked, and they'll be holding the crowns of their lives that they're placing before the feet of Christ. Um, so what they're trying to communicate here is they're about to receive the Eucharist, which is more precious than the crown of their life. It's participation with the body of Christ. So what you have um, uh, in looking at the fullness of Christ and his humanity is you, um, you begin to see this vision of Christ as pantocrator, Christ as as ruler over all the world, as creator of all things. And of course, this again is perfectly consistent 
with the earliest strata of the Christian tradition about who Christ is, right? Because it's not just that Jesus died for your sins, is that Jesus is the word incarnate. So when Jesus is made uh, incarnate, that is the word becoming flesh, right? So then stepping back, if the word existed and pre-existed with God from all eternity, then every moment in which God speaks a word is a moment in which God speaks through Christ, through, through, through the Logos, who then we come to know as Jesus Christ. So uh, this was, this was a, a way of saying that, that, that the Logos of God, the Son of God, was the agent in creation. And that in creation, you can find an image not only of our creation, but our redemption, that all things are redeemable. And that has been revealed fully on the cross. Even death, even sin, even things that seem God-forsaken are redeemable with Christ. Um, and this uh, begins to take place where you have a um, figure of Christ holding a book, which is the book of life, and then usually doing a triune gesture, which is consistent with Eastern Orthodoxy, to, um, to, to be clear about the, the Holy Spirit having its own personhood, and the Father and the Son, and then this thesis, which means um, basically supplication. This is a, it, it, this is a uh, moment in which the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist are imploring Christ to, um, to save humanity, to engage in his saving work. This is a very late piece. It was done after the Roman, uh, the, 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 uh, the Western Empire uh, came back into force and conquered Constantinople. Then they were kicked out by the Eastern Empire. And this was a reassertion of Eastern Orthodoxy. It's a magnificent piece that was discovered in the 30s again. And here's an earlier piece um, of the same image from uh, Daphne Monastery, which is right outside of Athens, of Christ the Pantocrator, Christ the ruler of all things. And what this all meant is that you had a kind of, of um, change in, um, <laughs> in the way that the space of worship is transformed. Because when you have the image in the gospel book and the the uh, proskasis, the reverence being done, these things begin to affect and they move into the life of the church. And they begin to move into the life of the church not only on high feast days, but they come to represent the space through which um, people moved in Eastern Christianity. And so I'm going to just show you a little piece I found. Um, the Orthodox Church is, is like that. Uh, they have incredible... Um, Information. Now, this is an 11 minute video, so I won't show you the whole thing. But, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. That's going to be good too, though. Um, so, this is a Orthodox Church versus the Roman Catholic Church. So, here's a cardinal coming to visit. I think this is the United States. So here you have the priest doing the coming in. You have the um, that's your deacon, sub deacon, and, and um, um, one other sub deacon. There's the cardinal himself, and there's the bishop. Who's the sub friend behind the bishop? You have two um, chaplains to the bishop, and they're going to come in and they're going to do a reverence as they come in. So the cardinal takes his hat, bows to the altar.
So lots of movement here. There's no, it's a less, little less organized in some ways for us. There's your icon of the day, which has been placed. The first thing he does is he reverences the icon. So he comes in and he kisses the icon, first in Aces. And then he blesses the icon, so there's a return of blessing. And then as he's moving his way around, people begin to venerate his hand and his cross. So they begin to, he becomes in some sense uh, a living image, as it were, of God. There's going to be a movement through this. And uh, there's here, you have a reliquum. So this has been opened up. This is full of bones and pieces of saints. And so he takes off the symbols of his office, blesses himself, and comes up. And then he's going to kiss the relics, kiss the bones of the, of the saints of the place before he leaves or moves on into the service. And replaces the symbols of his office on. Ah. You'll see a different amount of scene. There's no, there isn't the same use of choir. The choir is not part of the chancel. It things. It's a very more solemn thing. And then people go through it to go. And then he's going to start to to make a uh, to, to to do some solemn prayers. Again, not everybody is focused on this one. Peace. You know, this is happening in the, in the background. Now, here's a procession of Pope Francis with cardinals in Rome. So, this is, uh, again, very austere. Here they are, all coming in. Is that the Sistine Chapel? This is in uh, the Sistine Chapel. And then here is the same thing. We have a hiking out of the gathering. that's going on here. And then here, uh, here you have uh, an orthodoxy of Eucharist. Now, the, the chancel, the place, the sanctuary where the Eucharist takes place is behind doors, behind an anastasis of, of, um, of, of icons that are changed out according to the liturgical season originally, although many of them have now become fixed. And so what happens is the priest goes back there and there's this amazing amounts. I had one other one I was going to use you, uh, but this guy just sings so beautifully, I wanted to hear him today. Um, here, he, there's a chanting and movement, and what he does is the bread, uh, they, have two, they, they begin with a large loaf that has an imprint of a lamb on it, and they cut a piece of the loaf that's being used by the priest for consecration. The rest of it is cut up into pieces and placed in a basket, and that's shared with people who are not ready for communion. So if you and I went and we had a friend there at an Eastern Orthodox Church, we would kind of, we wouldn't be able to go up for communion, but someone might bring us a piece of the material bread that was not blessed by the priest, but had been kind of blessed, had been an early blessing on it, but it wasn't the body of Christ. And you'd receive that as, your, as a little symbol of your connection through the bread to the body of Christ that had become and so what happens is, you'll see that the chalices are enormous. Um, uh, and that's because he's going to cut this, ultimately he's going to take this piece of bread and put it into the chalice. And then they're going to take spoons, and each of you come up and they kind of dig into the besotted bread, and they flick it into your mouth. Um, with that, it, 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 and I understand that practice makes perfect, that you, uh, <laughs> as it comes in, you don't pick people on the Things like that. But here is that moment in which he's breaking the bread. Whoops. This is not what I wanted. Yeah. Between the celebrant and the 
with everybody else. space and time, the kind of spatial representation, the church becomes, as it were, an icon itself, and you're entering into the space of the icon, and you're being transformed by the images around you, and you're being changed, and occasionally, you can get a celebrant who gets a little out of hand. So this is the moment of Asperger's. This happens on Epiphany, particularly, in which you will be reminded of your baptism and receive water. Now this, 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 this Orthodox priest got a little out of hand. Uh, and so you can see. <laughs> so now he blesses the, he bless the icon. Now he's blessing the people. <laughs> Yeah, he's, this, is, this is just the beginning. Now he got it. He's getting over this way. Now it's really good. And now he goes into the people. And he starts to bless the people. And uh, I've never seen this much commotion in an Orthodox church. So I mean, I think that they're a little bit like this guy's out of hand a little bit. But he's, in, but he's not going to stop. He's going to take
cohesiveness by living through Detroit's breaking apart and coming together. And so Eugenides gave a, an answer. He said, well, this, this, the single image that was in his mind as he wrote the novel was this. But the only pic or visual artifact that I had to the book was actually the interior of a Greek Orthodox church. They were very gaudy in many respects. Iconography on all the walls. There's a lot of activity in the same way there's a lot of activity in Middlesex and in all the, of the characters. There are very bright spots and there are also many dark spot, spots where you have the lamps swinging, smoking, and a litany of prayers. There usually is also a dome and across the dome you'll find the Christ Pantocrator who's transcendent, looking down on the partisans and on creation. In a way I think my narrator is Christ Pantocrator. So the idea of something very colorful and swirling with light with the dominant intelligence screening over was the image I had in my mind if I did have a single image. So what is your image? Questions, comments? I have a question about the last paragraph of your fifth uh, insert. And I find it troubling. The, the material and your talk begin with the idea that icons are, can be a legitimate way of praying and worshiping in this life and understanding and apprehending God. But that last paragraph seems to me a hardening of that very point of view. If anyone does not venerate yeah. the image, let him be deprived. I find that very disturbing. Does it mean what I take it to mean? Yes. Well, they, they, didn't, they didn't leave a lot to democracy in the early church, right? They, they didn't, um, you know, they, they, they believed that how you prayed was really, really key to how you, how, how, to your, your, your salvation. And, and keep in mind that this is, this is the ninth century, but still, Christianity had only become a legitimate religion in the fourth century. And it was one of the first times people could identify in a different way than their ethnicity or their territory. In other words, what you were as a Christian was based upon your profession, who you said you were, which is why um, they took the whole uh, 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 renunciation during persecution so seriously. Because when you say, I am a Christian, you're, you're, basing, you're based on vows that you made to God, nothing else. And so their only way of holding this together was to make a very powerful statement about, about what is required. Now, the, the, the benefit of this is that they were, they were anathemizing themselves all over the place. <laughs> so you just have to go a little bit earlier there and you see at the second Nicaea, they say, you know, if anybody venerates an icon, they are shut out from God. And so they, there are a lot of pronouncements back and forth. And to this day in Eastern Orthodoxy, although the Eastern Orthodox Church on YouTube will convey to you this wonderful, beautiful relationship between all of these independent churches, all with their own color and their own, their own way of doing things, the Eastern Orthodox Church is full of people anathemizing each other. <laughs> you know, and so I do think that Westerners have developed through a reassertion of the word ways to discuss and to, to bring together things. But I do think we've lost something. Um, I do think that, I think the images are, are powerful to us. And I, and, I, and I think that that's an important thing that we, we probably need to bring back. Uh, with care. With care. With care. Bring it back with care. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Look what happened to the Eastern Orthodox Church. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, I, I think that... Think, think about uh, Lenin. If you know that yes. Yes. Seriously. No, it's a good thing, and and uh, I don't want to tell tales out of school, but um, I know that uh, the the new dean of the cathedral in Nashville, of the Episcopal Cathedral, has brought back total immersion baptism because he believes that you need to have total immersion baptism in order to really understand the ritual of, of baptism in your life, the sacrament of baptism in your life, and the congregation coming from. Tennessee, where total immersion baptism is actually a way of looking like everybody else. For them, it's a hard thing for them to hear. So I think you have to think about the social context, you have to think about the theology behind it, 
you have to be always careful. Sorry, I can't. Yeah, I just wanted to, it actually goes to something Eric was saying, the kind of hardening of it, because if you look at artistry, from the artist's point of view and, and icons, over the centuries, very little change, very little change in how people are depicted, very straightforward, yeah. faces never in profile, always straightforward, very formal, and the, the palette never changes, whereas the Western side, you see, we go through the Gothic, we get into eventually, you know, the Renaissance, the palette changes, if you look at Gothic, you see that, that Virgin Mary is always clothed in vermilion, because cinnabar, which is a highly toxic mineral, was the most expensive, and you wanted the Virgin Mary to be with the most expensive color. In the Renaissance, it was lapis lazuli, which is that beautiful blue. Now, that's, you know, you, you, you see Michelangelo, you see Leonardo, who are, who are under no proscription to actually pray as they paint. There's no indication that while he was painting the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo was thinking about anything other than color, line, form, getting something that exists in three dimensions to work in two, yeah. so you can tell what it is. The Eastern tradition has always remained very, very rigid, and it's lovely, and I know people who write icons today, gay Pope being a, a one. But as far as from an artist's point of view, those people were in a very strict box that they could never get out of. One of the things that uh, many of you were here for Niamh Holtz Weber's visit, and one of the pieces, I've got to run them late, but uh, is she, um, she uses classic Greek icons, and then she uses uh, collages from magazines. And each of her, she has the children fill them in with all of these things, and they're absolutely gorgeous. I, she, she was sending them to me, and I, we kept them going back and forth, and never quite got them. I'm gonna bug her once she gets home. Um, because I, I actually think that you can, you can work somewhere in between those two, because there is something powerful about the image. And next week, we're gonna start to look into some canonical icons and just start to unpack them, right? So that we can get an idea of how to read them. And, uh, and I think you'll be, you know, I think, I think it, it can, it, can has, it does have something to teach us. Yeah. I gotta run. <laughs> See you guys, thank you. Oh, this was obvious.